So we have one last problem to discuss in our graphing polynomial section. That is a polynomial inequality. So whenever you're trying to solve an inequality, you have to keep a few things in mind. First of all, you need your zero to be on the right hand side. And tell me what exactly does this mean? All of this has to be less than zero, which means we want our polynomial to be negative. It can't be equal to zero, it has to be simply negative. So we have to figure out where exactly does this polynomial go negative, okay? Now sometimes we can find that on a graph and sometimes it's kind of difficult to do that. So what we have to do is first completely factor this and find all the x-intercepts. All right, so how do we factor this polynomial? That goes all the way back to our p's and q's. What is p in this problem? 36, because that's your constant, and q is 1. So we write all the factors of 36. That would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 9, 12, 18, and 36, I believe. And then all the factors of 1 would just be positive and negative 1. If we do p over q, we have 1 over 1, 2 over 1, 3 over 1. We actually just end up with this list, right? So I'm going to make a shortcut and say p over q would be all of this list right here. Remember, that's only true because our q is 1. Okay, that doesn't always work. So we need to try some. I'm going to leave the video running while I try some. So I'm going to store 1 and then type in the polynomial. x to the 4th plus x cubed minus 15x squared minus 3x plus 36. So 1 doesn't work. I'll store negative 1. That does not work. I'll store 2. That does not work. Negative 2 does not work. 3 works. So we find out that 3 works, which means we stop there and we do long division. Not long division, synthetic division. So in the synthetic division, we put all of our coefficients. 1, 1, negative 15, negative 3, 36. Bring down the 1, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. Rewrite it in factored form, so we have x minus that number we just got. Now this exponent is 4, and when we decrease that one by 1, we get 3. So we need to decrease these by 1 all the way to the right, and we get x cubed plus 4x squared minus 3x minus 12, and all of that is less than 0. Now we still need to factor this. We have four terms, so we should see if it factors by grouping. If we factor by grouping, actually it looks like this one will work, factor by grouping. But just in case it didn't, what would you have to do? If this would not factor by grouping, you would have to treat all of the stuff in this parentheses as another problem and do p's and q's again. So you just keep stacking the factors on top of each other. All right, so let's go ahead and factor this little guy. You can factor in x squared out of the first two. You're left with x plus four. You can factor in negative three out of the second two and you're left with x plus four. Now you can factor out your x plus 4, and you're left with x squared minus 3. So what we have at this point is x minus 3, x plus 4, x squared minus 3, and all of that less than 0. 
we still need to factor this set of parentheses. There's a couple of ways you can do that. Probably the easiest way is to just set it equal to 0 and find out what the zeros are. So x squared equals 3. Take the square root of both sides and don't forget plus or minus. That means that x is equal to positive and negative square root of 3. So whenever you write it in factored form, you have x minus 3, x plus 4, and then x minus each of these. So x minus the square root of 3 and x plus the square root of 3, and that's all less than 0. So this is what you call completely factored form. But to do anything with this problem, we need to find what the zeros are. Remember that means to just set everything equal to 0. So x minus 3 equals 0, x plus 4 equals 0, x minus the square root of 3 equals 0, and x plus the square root of 3 equals 0. So x equals 3, x equals negative 4, x equals the square root of 3, and x equals the negative square root of 3. So all of these are going to be our zeros. Your zeros are also called the endpoints. So these are what we're going to call our endpoints. Now we need to draw a number line. We put all of these numbers on the number line. Make sure you put them in the correct order. So negative 4 comes first. Then we have negative square root of 3. By the way, that's approximately negative 1.7. Then we have the square root of 3, which is approximately 1.7. And then we have 3. So those will be what are called endpoints. Now we need some test points. So we need to pick points in all of these intervals. I think I'll pick a negative 6, something between negative 4 and negative 1.7. Let's say negative 3. Between these two, we can pick 0 between these two maybe a 2 and out here maybe a 6. So what we want to do is take our test points and plug them into the formula and we can do that by storing them. Negative 6 still x enter. I already have the function in there from before and if I plug that in I find out that I get a positive. So then I store negative 3, and I find out that I get a negative. If I store a 0, I get a positive. If I store a 2, I get a negative. And if I store a 6, I get a positive. It's not going to always alternate like that, by the way. There is a reason this one does. So, I have a question. Can x actually equal each of the endpoints? These highlighted numbers mean that if you plug those into the formula or into the inequality, you're going to get 0 on the left. Is 0 less than 0? No. So that means x can't actually equal any of these endpoints. So we're going to put dashed lines at each of the endpoints to remind us that it can't really be there. Now, this means we want everywhere the function goes negative. It goes negative everywhere we have a negative sign. That means we want to keep the intervals between negative 4 and negative square root of 3. and square root of 3 and 3. Those will be all of our solutions. So I want to have a look at the graph of this function. Before we go to the graph, keep these numbers in mind. Negative 4 to negative 1.7 and then 1.7 to 3. 
And also remember that the whole point to this problem was finding where the function is negative. Okay, so our graph actually looks like this. Remember, we said negative 4 to negative 1.7, and then 1.7 to 3. Notice how at each of these, your function goes below the x-axis. That's what we were looking for. Where does the graph go negative? Where does it go below the y -ax, uh, the x-axis? So if our problem here had said greater than zero, we would have been looking for where the graph goes positive. So we would have been looking for these parts. And if you remember our sign chart, that is exactly where the graph was positive. So your solution to this inequality, one more time, is here. That is where your graph goes negative.